Hi everyone. My name is Steve Blasick. I'm a partner here at Ritchie May. We are a CPA firm that specializes in alternative investments. We're very excited to be launching our Ritchie May Capital Education Series. The reason we are hosting this is because whenever we speak with our clients and friends in the industry about audit and tax services, the topic of capital raising almost always comes up. So we really wanted to bring some value to the industry and make everybody's life a little bit easier. Over the next six months, we're going to be offering a handful of webinars and podcasts covering different topics geared around capital raising. Some of these topics will be the right investor for you, Rule 506B or 506C, allocating money and the due diligence process behind it, bringing on IRA money as an additional way to raise capital, and of course, the perfect pitch book. We will also be covering a couple of different capital raising platforms that will be offered at a discounted rate because you're a client of Richie Mays. We really hope you find this beneficial. And now I will hand this over to our good friends, Bob Marietta and Dan Lancelotti at Cap Insure Solutions to kick off our first webinar. Great, so um, thanks everybody for coming. We just had a little short intro from, from Steve Blasick of our Alternative Investments Department if you're just coming in. Um, I'm Eliza Berry, Marketing Director with Richie May, and uh, thank you again for joining our webinar today. Just a couple of quick little housekeeping items. Um, we are recording this webinar, so thanks for watching this if you're watching this in the future on the replay. Um, we will send out the recording as well as the slide deck materials um, in an email in the next day or two to everyone who registered. Uh, please feel free to share that with anyone um, else at your company who you think might benefit or in your network. Um, as Steve mentioned, this is part of our capital education series. Um, so it's really meant for you to be able to build your understanding of these current issues and in alternative investments. Um, and of course, reach out as you need to. The contact information for uh, Steve Lassick will be available um, in the presentation as well as our presenters today from Cap Intro. Um, they are going to be presenting um, on their slide deck. Of course, if you have any um, questions during the uh, process of the presentation, feel free to ask those in the questions panel or in the chat. Um, I'll pipe up and answer or and ask those at the end during our Q&A section um, or ask them on the relevant slides um, as we're going. And um, without further ado, I will pass it over to Bob and Dan. Thank you guys. Okay, thank you very much, Eliza, and thanks everybody for joining us today. We are excited to be part of today's presentation and really um, value and, and appreciate the, the partnership with Richie May, uh, as you all know, um, one of the most respected audit firms in the alternative investment space. So we're excited to be here today. Um, we are going to be giving a, a brief presentation, uh, and uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduced managing uh, principal of Cap Intro Solutions, Dan Lancelotti, who will give you an overview of today's agenda. So thank you, Robert. Um, many of you have um, already made your decision um, as to whether to, to choose Rule 506B or 506C as your um, offering um, umbrella. Um, but we'll discuss some of the marketing strategies that may go along with that decision process uh, so that um, if you have already made the decision, this is, will be relevant. Um, we will, for those who have not made the decision, um, go through a little bit of the background on the rules and the differences of them. Um, we will talk about um, the implementation of 506C, which is a little bit more intricate than 506b um, but then we'll also discuss um, the difference in the um, fund structure which actually uh, interplays with the decision of 506 b and c uh, as well and um, the the fund structure of either 3c1 or 3c7 um, is definitely married to the decision of 506 b or 506 c um, so it is a bigger decision um, that you have to uh, entertain. And um, then um, regardless of what decision you make, um, we'll talk a little bit about some best practices with respects to um, marketing and sales. So 
you can tell by um, these pictures that we are not lawyers. Um, we may be coaches uh, of basketball, baseball, et cetera, but lawyers, we are not. Um, so please don't take anything. This is your, your, your typical disclaimer slide. We try to perk it up a little bit by showing wonderful pictures of Bob and myself uh, in action. Um, but um, the disclaimer is, is that we are not lawyers. Do not take anything that we say um, as uh, legal advice. Uh, most of this information is actually available from the government, um, amazingly. Um, the link to that um, government site um, is on this page, uh, highlighted in, in the light blue. Uh, and so um, at the end of the day, um, you should go and, and visit that site um, for more details should you need them. Um, so if we're not lawyers, who are we? Um, I'm Dan Lancelotti. Um, I graduated um, back um, before a lot of you people were probably born. Um, and uh, <laughs> with an Apple Math Econ degree, uh, and I sold fixed income for the early portion of my career. I worked at a FinTech startup, uh, not startup, excuse me, a FinTech um, firm called Interactive Data Corporation, uh, doing fixed income analysis after my stellar career as a bond salesman. Uh, and then finally, I jumped to the sell side um, at Smith Bonney uh, in 94 and worked in fixed income risk management and then uh, retail fixed income trading. Uh, and interestingly, um, as Smith Bonney transitioned to Solomon Smith Bonney and to, then to City, uh, my manager, who was responsible for prime brokerage as well as some of the fixed income businesses I worked in, uh, because Jamie Dimon felt that um, stock loan and, and prime brokerage was a more fixed income kind of business than it was an equity business. Um, came to me and said, listen, we need to have a cap intro department started up in prime brokerage. Uh, and this was in the year 2000. So I started uh, the capital introduction uh, unit of Citigroup. Um, and it was simply me to get to learn all these regulations and uh, understand how not to transgress the law in doing cap intro. Um, and so that was a really fun time. Uh, and over the years between 2000 and 2008, um, the department went from just myself to 25 people worldwide. Um, and at its height, just in 2008, uh, we had locations in, in, on all three of the major continents and all the major cities. But when 08 hit, uh, there was not a need for that kind of a department, the size of that department. So we shrunk it down. I left the organization to, to um, start up uh, what I hoped would be a, a fintech a, a fintech solution to cap intro um, called Capital Dynamo, which exists today. And um, within cap intro solutions, we use the the software that Capital Dynamo has developed. And subsequently, um, we deploy that software in our solution. Um, to help managers with their cap intro needs. Uh, and um, I have um, partnered with Bob and several others to, to run that um, from this point forward. Okay, and uh, I'll jump in quickly and give you a little uh, background on myself and then we'll dig further into the presentation. I'll back up one slide uh, just to say, hopefully you see a resemblance somewhere uh, to me on the right and a little guy dribbling a basketball because that is my son. Uh, that's about four or five years ago. He'll be 15 tomorrow. So I don't know if he resembles me or not. Hopefully he doesn't. Uh, and that'll be to his benefit. But uh, as Dan said, we're pretty experienced in this space. Uh, I've got over 30 years of uh, experience in um, investment management services and in the financial uh, securities industry. Uh, primarily uh, in prime brokerage, I would say I've got about 20 years or so in prime brokerage between UBS, um, Canna Fitzgerald, and Trade Station. So, um, you know, we, I've met Dan probably at my time uh, about 10 years ago at Trade Station. Um, you know, we, we struck up a, a great rapport and friendship at that time, and I was ecstatic to join Cap Intro Solutions uh, and offer outsourced capital introduction uh, to, uh, you know, both emerging startup and early stage and established managers. So I'll just give you a little brief background of what we're doing at Cap Intro Solutions and then we'll dive into the presentation. 
Uh, we are, uh, you know, just as we said, an outsourced capital introduction um, uh, solution. And basically our model runs very much like you would find at, at Bulls Bracket Prime Brokers. Uh, really what our, our job is to do, we're not third party marketers. We are capital introduction in the truest sense. What we like to do is present our managers in front of our, our base of institutional and investors. Um, you know, and we have two types of services, both subscription models, and we can always, uh, you know, catch up, all, all, you know, uh, offline down the road if you want more information. I don't want to get too much into the detail today, but two different levels of service. One is our white glove, um, you know, full service model where we call it T to green, where we basically will uh, do all the legwork leading up to a meeting with an investor, uh, and then we let that manager uh, manage that sales process with the investor. Um, and we also have a, uh, a do-it-yourself type version or a lighter version of that service for managers who prefer to perform the outreach on their own. We provide our managers with investor profiles for them to do the outreach, make the call, send the emails. Um, and that is a, a service that's a, a newer service that we actually just launched probably in the last uh, five or six months. And so far, uh, people, uh, we've gotten some great reviews on it. So we're pretty excited about what 2021 can bring and what we can offer to our uh, manager clients out there. So uh, again, I can always talk offline and we'll, we'll, we'll recap at the end of this presentation, but we wanna move forward and, and we're gonna go into 506B and 506C. And Dan, would you like to compare and contrast the two for us? Sure, Bob. Um... Both 506B and C um, have their origins in the Securities Act of 1933. Um, I remember um, when, when Congress actually enacted that act. Um, but um, the uh, Securities Act of 33 had Section 4A2 in it, um, which is known as the private placement exemption, so that securities um, could be issued um, without being uh, registered. Uh, and um, that um, the, the two rules that we're talking about weren't around at that time. They actually came um, with um, Regulation D, uh, which was added to the Act in 1982, and Rule 506 of Regulation D. Um, in fact, um, the issued securities are restricted. So, so at the end of the day, um, regardless of which regulation you pick, rule you pick to register under, um, each issues registered um, restricted securities, which means that they cannot be transferred um, in, in any way publicly. Um, so that's a similarity. Um, regardless of which rule you issue your fund under, uh, you are required to file a what's called a Form D um, within 15 days of the first sale. Many um, managers will file a Form D prior to their first sale, simply to make certain that, you know, quite frankly, it doesn't slip through the cracks when they do make their first sale. But the government only requires you to file this Form D um, within for 15 days of having made a sale. Um, both rules um, uh, subject the, the manager to the bad actor disqualification. There should probably be no surprise there. Um, the SEC doesn't want bad actors running around um, issuing securities, um, whether they are private or not. So um, there are no bad actors allowed within the fund or the offering of the fund. Um, both uh, rules allow for exempt exemptions from state blue sky laws. Now, to me, that this would sound like a great thing because you don't have to worry about what 50 states are going to tell you about your your um, issuance. However, um, it's you still have to file notices and pay fees that you are offering securities um, in that particular state. Should you offer them in that state? and so or have subscribers in that state. So while you don't have to register the security, um, you're still, you still got to worry about making sure you file the notice and pay the fee, um, which is almost you know, nine tenths of the issue when you're dealing with a state. You don't have to worry about any individual state regulations that might be different 
um, than the federal governments, but you still have to make the filings. Uh, and again, uh, just like with bad actors, um, it doesn't allow you to um, fraudulently um, sell securities. You have to, you, you are still subject to anti-fraud provisions um, of the solicitation. So at the end of the day, um, you know, you, you have to be um, on the up and up when you're offering these securities. You're not allowed to violate the law. Again, that probably seems self-explanatory, but um, the government makes sure that uh, you're aware of that. Yeah, okay, so those are the similarities between 506B and 506C. Uh, can you tell us about some of the differences? Sure. So, so I misspoke a little bit earlier. Um, Regulation D came about in 1982, and 506B was initially um, in uh, that regulation. Um, Rule 506C, however, came out in, uh, as part of the Jobs Act in 2013 and was added to Regulation D. So again, this is, you can tell I'm not a lawyer. Um, at the end of the day, you've got the Securities Act of 33, then Reg D was added to the Securities Act, along with Rule 506B in 1982, and then Rule 506C came along in 2013. 506B allows you up to 35 non-accredited investors. So people who are not accredited, friends and family, um, can be allowed to participate in a 506B offering. That's not the case in a 506C. There can be no non-accredited investors in a 506C, okay? And, and that's one of the major distinctions between these two rules. Um, additionally, if you do take non-accredited investors into a 506C, um, excuse me, 506B, you are required to provide them with a great deal of documentation, very similar to as if the security had been offered publicly. So again, this is another one of the big distinctions between B and C um, and non-accredited and accredited. So um, there are a number of decisions to be made, as we'll get into, but one of them is, is if you do take accredited invest, non-accredited investors into your 506B offering, you got to worry about the, the, the level of documentation that they need to be given. Um, everyone who comes into a 506B offering has got to be known to the manager prior to the solicitation. So this is exactly um, one of the points in, in the securities regulations that gave rise to capital introduction units within prime brokers and to us as a firm, because um, the ability for the manager to piggyback on a relationship that an outside um, provider might have to that investor is allowed. And so subsequently, um, if your prime broker's cap intro team, or if we know in a particular investor, um, that helps to, to get past the point of the regulation where you cannot um, have investors coming into this um, offering cold. There are other ways to get to know investors prior to letting them into your offering, and, and um, they're perfectly acceptable. Um, but one of the fastest ways is to use somebody who knows that investor prior. With 506C, you don't have to worry about that. 506C allows for general solicitation. So, so at the end of the day, you can meet somebody on the street um, without knowing who they are and, and actually solicit them for your offering. However, um, in, in, before they actually become a client before they actually sign the documentation, you have to make certain that they are accredited. Because again, no non-accredited investors are allowed in a 506C. So you, in a 506C offering, you have to do a good deal of due diligence on the particular investor um, before you actually allow them to get um, into the offering. And, and again, this is another one of the big distinctions here as to which 
um, offering you decide to go with, um, whether you want to actually engage in that kind of, of due diligence that's required to ensure that the investor you have met on the street is an accredited investor. And you know, the, the, the um, website that I mentioned previously has got a lot of helpful tips as to how that can go um, be accomplished things like uh, looking at tax statements and, and, and reviewing other financial documents that the investor might have um, that would give you um, comfort that they are accredited um, are mentioned there. Um, but it is not as simplistic as what would happen in a 506B. Understood. Okay. Well, I guess we're going to move along to Form B, can you speak about Form B, Dan, and, and tell us why it's important and what managers need to know about it? Well, it's important because the government makes you do it. Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, um, every um, non-public offering is required to file a Form D um, if you're exempted under Rule 506, Rule 506 either B or C, under Reg D, under the Securities Exchange Act of 1933. Um, excuse me, Securities Act of 1933, as opposed to the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. I'm going to be a lawyer by the time this is all over. Uh, um, but um, it is required. And so, uh, again, it's after 15 days of, from the first sale or in advance. It does not, it, there's no um, restriction on filing it in advance if um, you, you want to. Um, but you have to file it electronically. Um, if this is one of the documents that is no longer allowed to be mailed in um, and, and done um, physically. It has to be done electronically over the Edgar system provided um, by the SEC. Uh, and to order the, to access the Edgar system, um, you'll need to have what's called a CIK, uh, Central Index Key. Um, those are issued via Edgar. Um, so you can get onto Edgar, request a CIK, um, and that is the, the um, linchpin needed in order to be able to file a, a Form D. And there's a lot of confusion about um, Form D updating. Um, Form Ds need to be updated, um, and if, if the offering is continuing on a yearly basis. So the, the definition of continuing is one you should discuss with your lawyer. Um, depending upon what the state of your asset raising is, um, it may not necessarily um, be defined as continuing. So you wouldn't have to update your Form D. Um, it's not a big deal to update your Form D. Um, so it's probably best practice to, to go ahead and do that on a regular basis if you're still offering um, your um, fund. Um, and it's also required if certain things change. Um, the list of things that need to be changed is not that long, um, but it's it's variable. And so subsequently, um, again, you need to consult um, a lawyer to determine whether um, your Form D needs to be updated. Things like changing your address, which you think might um, require a Form D update, actually don't. Um, the, the the types of things that they ask to be updated um, uh, is is pretty nuanced. So again, consult that. But if, if something changes with your offering, um, a Form D update may be um, needed. Okay. Well, when considering 506B versus 506C, what considerations are, are taken into account? What's considered most appropriate? So so the one of the big things. Um, <laughs> um, I go by is who's doing what. Um, we keep track of Form D filings. Um, and in 2020, um, there were 1,394 new Form D hedge fund filings. Um, the numbers of folks um, that chose um, Rule 506B was 94%, and who picked Rule C was only 6%. So 506C. So there may be something to be read into that. Um, you know, the, the, the considerations, um, re as I mentioned previously, really do come down to uh, sort of the non-accredited investor participation. 
um, in the offering? Um, where is your, your seed capital coming from? Um, do you need to um, offer this to non-accredited investors in order to get in the business? Um, one thing that you need to, but besides the documentation that is required when you um, undertake a, a 506B with non-accredited investors is that um, besides the documentation, you also have to have a knowledgeable representative um, present with that non-accredited investor, whether that's a friend of the non-accredited investor who might be in the securities industry or actually some people actually provide that representative, uh, pay for somebody to represent the non-accredited investor in the meeting. Um, that's a little bit of ex an extreme, but it, it is definitely happened. Um, and so there's there are that's a consideration, whether you want non-accredited investors in the offering um, and and you know the documentation and the representation that's required on their behalf in order to get them into the offering. Um, another consideration is, is if you don't take and and one that people don't consider a lot is but is is available um, that if you do start with a 506B offering and you do not take a non-accredited investor. So it's all accredited investors in the fund. You can actually switch. You can you can transition from 506B to 506C. Um, it's not done a lot, but but as long as there are not any non-accredited, um, there is a path to to changing your mind. Um, going back the other way, I'm told, is a lot more difficult. Um, and subsequently, um, if you decide to be a 506C you're probably not gonna go back to being a 506B. Um, but um, you could go from 506B to 506C as long as you haven't decided to take mom into the offering. So, so the deal is, do you really wanna have mom? Okay, or do you need to have mom? Um, and, and subsequently, um, a lot of times, um, there's, there, there could be good reasons to be able to exclude mom by saying, hey, ma, I'm a 506C, I'm sorry, but no non-accredited investors are allowed in a 506C. Uh, and, and it can absolutely be a, a lifesaver um, in having to deal with friends and family, especially if, if, you know, there are a lot of you out there, probably smaller managers, um, starting with their own money, uh, and don't want to have the burden of performing with people's monies that um, they want to really give it to you because they feel that you're you're credit worthy and and credible in in helping them manage their assets and that's a wonderful position for them to regard you in. But at the end of the day, it's a burden as well. And so um, you know, a lot of times um, it's it would be easier to, to avoid that burden by um, registering in a way that uh, doesn't allow you to take the non-accredited investor. Okay, well, and that's time, next time we'll discuss is gonna be websites, Dan, and uh, can you, they can make a, a very big impact for the manager. Can you uh, describe some of the factors that uh, need to be considered when creating a website as a, as a manager? Well, it, um, it, it's it's one of probably not a very well known um, issue that that websites are governed to a degree by the decision as to do 506b or 506c um, because it is a form of of advertising in essence um, when you um, put out a website um, or social media at all um, the 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 stigma or the, the, the association with be, being advertising um, is there, is very prevalent, um, especially in the, in the minds of the SEC and the regulators. So, so um, a lot of times, and by the way, it's a consideration too, because if you just like to put up a dashboard um, and, and announce your presence to the world, um, that's allowable under 506B. There's, there's really no advertising there, um, but um, if you would like to make a, a more functional website, um, 
and and again this is a legal issue to discuss with your attorney but how intricate and how um, how much you disclose on that website about your operation uh, and about your personnel and the assets under management and your performance um, does trend towards advertising and there's a line that you're going to cross where it's going to be regarded as advertising and so subsequently um, 506b would not allow for that where 506c would so so if you would like to be able to put a presence out there that is more self-service to investors uh, than the the standard dashboard is and please contact because you know if you put yourself in the position of an investor uh, a, a, an accredited institutional investor who was hearing about you for the first time uh, the ability for them to drill down into your website into certain things about yourself and your fund um, could be very advantageous um, to drawing them in as opposed to stopping them with you know a, a dashboard that says a home page that just says you know click here for access um, lots of guys uh, and lots of women you know from the investor side of the equation want to remain anonymous um, again that's why cap intro exists because a lot of the investors want to remain anonymous up until the point where they're comfortable with either disclosing who they are or taking a meeting and um, with a website that allows them to do some of that self-service um, they would be much more comfortable potentially you know talking to you that said you'll never know if they come and go i mean certainly you can put trackers on your website you can see people coming in you can't see who they are um and and so subsequently you may never know that a a major investor came in and poked around um because you didn't have you didn't stop them and take their name so really it really does um there there are pros and cons to each side of this uh that um you need to consider um when making this decision um and another one would be uh <laughs> you'd love to be in the position of being able to put your name on a stadium um but that would be considered advertising uh and so um you have to be a 506c in order to rename gillette stadium in foxborough um or any stadium near your home <laughs> shouldn't we be so lucky um but take that um one step further and um the sponsorships of a, a new ball field for little league if if you're so inclined or um your name on the back of the t-shirts of the players um it could be something that you'd have to consider ad as advertising um with um you know the regulators and your lawyer um so so there are those kinds of considerations um, right. to, the, the, to the, well, the website and everything that you mentioned that that's just one form of outreach and uh, you did touch briefly upon advertising uh and i was just curious as you know in all your experience in in this industry have you seen any funds advertised yeah, well, okay, so so this is the part of, of the um, presentation where we would have audience participation if we were alive. So um, just as a um, exercise for those at home, uh, everybody put up your hand if you've seen any hedge fund advertising in the press. Okay, that's a no. <laughs> I can, uh, not that I can see you, um, but I'm going to say that that's probably a no because we sort of keep up on this. And the last and and really only advertisement I've only been um, made aware of is one by Top Turn Capital in December 2013. It wasn't a um, uh, advertisement played on TV, but it was an advertisement that was posted on YouTube and and on their website um, and and in various um, media that that was online. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, I've I've posted a link where you could find it uh honestly thought it was exceptionally done um uh, top turn capital was a hundred million dollar um equity long short fund um they go through um a a robust description in about a minute and a half i think it is of of how they do what they do uh and it was 
truly well done. Professional quality from top to bottom. Um, so um, you should check it out. That said, wasn't cheap, okay? Um, if, if I re recall correctly, the principals told me something about 50,000 um, bucks. It runs about two and a half minutes, I guess. I was wrong a minute and a half. It's two and a half minutes, um, close to three minutes. Um, and, and that's a lot of money per minute. Um, but again, um, it, it has um, a lot of positive outcomes, not only in attracting um, investors, but also being able to recruit talent. Um, it, you know, at the end of the day, um, people will understand that you're a professional organization, that you take yourself seriously. Um, the, the, the quality of the video, um, again, um, puts out uh, uh, the, 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 the message that, that we are in this for the long haul. We, we take our craft seriously. Um, we are not um, afraid to talk about our craft. We are transparent in, in the way we address um, our mandate and subsequently um, has a lot of positive impact beyond just um, telling investors about what you do and how you do it. On the other hand, it's not all about advertising because uh, sadly, you know, in 2018, Top Turn's uh, performance wasn't terrific um, and they ended up closing shop. Um, they're still around as an RIA, um, but they ended up closing shop in, in, with uh, 26 million bucks. Um, or closing that fund down, that particular fund down. They still manage money and they still use parts of the video, I believe, in their, their RIA advertising. But um, it, was, it was a professionally done video and, and first rate. And so, th th again, that would be the, the flip side of doing advertising. You want to make sure you, the, the advertising comes off as professional and it's not in any way actually a detriment to your franchise. Hey, um, Dan, we actually got a question from a viewer that is relevant to this slide. Um, sure. She asked, posting fund information and or performance information on LinkedIn allowed by 506B, since it's within a network of people one knows. It shouldn't be considered as advertising to the public, right? Uh, watch that. Um, again, I'm not a lawyer, but um, if, you, if you can limit that message, and you know, you know, <laughs> you got to be a good LinkedIn professional because I've seen a lot of people make a mess of that when they posted something thinking that it was within their own little network and it was actually just on LinkedIn where anybody could. And, and, and by the way, I am not a LinkedIn securities expert. Um, I, I mess this up all the time um, <laughs> trying to post something to my friends and family and all of a sudden, you know, um, somebody comes at me. So you could technically be, you're, you're technically correct. Um, the question becomes whether technically you're able to pull that off. <laughs> um, it's, it would be just like sending out your investor letter to your, your network of people that you know. Um, but you gotta make sure that, that uh, you hit, you've got all the right switches on LinkedIn turned correctly. Hope that answers the question. Thanks for that. Sure. Okay. All right. So now, you know, 506B and 506C are not just the only questions that managers have to uh, think about. What else is important for them, particularly in regard to like proper organization and structure? Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I alluded to this a little earlier in the um, presentation, but um, 506, the rule 506 is married um, actually back to the, the um, initial regulation. Um, with um, how the actual fund is structured. So the, inve the, the Investment Company Act of 1940 specifies two structures of private placements. Um, one is 3C1 um, and the other is 3C7. And so at the end of the day, while Reg D and Rule 506 um, allow for um, 506B, allow for unlimited investors and 35 non-accredited investors. Um, you have to make certain that that um, works with 
the structure of the fund itself, either being a, a 3C1 or a 3C7, okay? Um, because uh, <laughs> 3C7s do not allow for unaccredited non-accredited investors, okay? Um, a 3C1 would, um, but then a 3C1 only allows for 100 investors overall. So you really got to be careful of, of the interplay between Rule 506C and B and Section 3C1 and 3C7, okay? Um, because they are not mutually exclusive, but they can be limiting. Um, the, the, the 3C7 um, marries with 506C better then uh, 3C1 doesn't marry with 506C um, because of the fact that um, you can't have, well, you can have 3C1 and 506C if you don't have any non-accredited investors. You would, but you would probably pick 506B and 3C1 if you were gonna do accredited investors. So they, they, they match up a little bit better than than um, the alternative. So you, you have you do have to think about how many investors you're going to have, where is your money coming from, and subsequently um, how that will marry um, with the rules and the sections. <laughs> um, I'm probably doing more to confuse than anything else, but this is why I'm not a lawyer. Um, but at the end of the day. Um, you've got to you've got to um, truly understand um, what um, your your client base is going to look like on day one, and um, also whether you would want to ever you know once you take a non-accredited investor you sort of can't go back either. So uh, you can probably throw them out of the fund, but that's going to be a problem in and of itself. So so <laughs> the decisions you got to make. Uh, do you really want to advertise or do you want to have non-accredited investors? That's sort of what it comes down to um, with respects to um, these four decisions you got to make. Um, the other thing is that 3C1 is, is only 100 investors. Um, 3C7 can be up to 2,000. But the problem with 3C7 is that every investor has to be a QP which means they have to have $5 million in investments. Um, that's sort of the baseline for an individual. If they are a money manager, they have to have 25 million in assets under management to invest. So again, that, that comes down to whether you really wanna have truly professionals in your fund as investors and whether you know those people on day one, whether they're going to be able to make an allocation to you on day one, whether you have to have that money on day one to be a viable business. Uh, and so subsequently, it really does um, matter um, how you plan on starting your business and growing it. And so that's, that's really where the, the, the rubber meets the road in this decision-making process. So for 3C1 versus 3C7, uh, what are the trade-offs between the two? Well, again, um, in, in to, to, to put a number on this, if you take 100 investors um, and each one of them um, gives you 250 grand, if you're, you've got a $250,000 minimum and everybody wants to come in at 250,000 um, bucks, you're going to cap yourself at $25 million as a, as a, under management. So so immediately you start to, to worry, you have to worry about how you fit, um, you know, the, the seed investors in with the hopefully bigger checks that come to you or would come to you down the road. And whether, you know, um, th 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 there's some planning that needs to go on there. Um, and, and so subsequently, um, you know, if you only leave five spaces for bigger tickets, <laughs> um, th that could be a problem. Um, and, and right now working with a, a fund that had that problem, um, and they're starting another 3C7 fund where they're going to move their QPs from 3C1 into the 3C7 fund. 
And that may be a fine way of addressing the problem, going with 3C1 and then starting a 3C7. But if all those people were QPs to begin with, and you had done a 3C7, um, you wouldn't have to the expense of having to go back and do the 3C1. I mean, it's, it's 3C7 after you had the 3C1. So again, it's knowing who you're marketing to, knowing where your seed capital is coming from, knowing what you need to know in order to, to um, um, advertise or not advertise, um, and subsequently, um, you know, really consulting your lawyer, but also your local marketer. Okay, um, you know, getting the the sense from the marketer as to how um, that fund could be best rolled out, or even now how the fund can be rolled out, and whether it, you know, if you're a three five oh six b, and it might be a good idea to switch to five oh six c, you know, work with your marketing team, uh, the, the people that you you consult from a marketing perspective and a sales perspective to think about um, the the um, trade-offs um, between these two. And then again, um, whether you're a section C31 or C3, 3C7 um, will also matter. Okay, all right, well, thank you. Now we've reached the point of the presentation where we are going to answer your questions. Now, I'd like to just touch base with one question we got before um the com the conference started and and it was about you know what is you know what's new in the in the environment what are we seeing over the last 12 months i mean uh it's pretty obvious <laughs> that there's a there's a lot of differences uh over the last 12 months what we've seen with the pandemic and and, and how the industry has shifted in some cases and in some cases it hasn't so Dan, would you like to talk about what you've seen in the last 12 months particularly in regard to uh let's say regulation perhaps and and what you think going forward we're going, we're going to see. Yeah, the regulatory environment hasn't changed all that much. Um, that said, you know, we've got new people at the SEC coming in, um, those that are, are um, historically tougher um, on, on this industry than, than the, the previous administration. That said, um, there, there was one real interesting thing that happened over the course of this year, um, which is unrelated to 506 B and C. I don't think we're going to see any. I mean, 506 C was introduced in 2013. I, I think that that's pretty much as far as we're going to go um, with, you know, being able to um, do um, you know, re relaxing some of the regulation around um, advertising and, and promotion um, for for a while. <laughs> um, but we did see something in, in Schedule 13D, um, which was, excuse me, 13F, which was sort of interesting. Um, the the um, SEC had, had um, suggested that the um, asset level for 13F filing, required 13F filings be moved from 100 million, which is where it is currently, to three and a half billion um, for for assets under management. Um, and and the 100 million um, regulation came out in 1975. And if you do the math um, at an 8% return rate, um, three and a half billion is where you would be in 2020 <laughs> for 100 million in 1975. Now, 8% is a pretty aggressive number, but still, the the argument was that we're only, from an asset perspective, we're only going to knock out 10% of the assets um, that are reported on. Um, whereas we're going to, um, from an issue, from a reporter perspective, we're going to knock out 90% of the people that report. Basically, it's the 80-20 rule where all of the assets are held by the big guys. Um, and they only represent 10% of the marketplace. 90% of the little guys, you know, over 100 million own a lot, you know, only 10% of the assets. So there was some, um, there was some rationale to their um, recommendation. That recommendation got roundly um, discredited in, in the press. There were 2,300 um, letters written against it. Um, some by some big money managers, some by some big investors and allocators, 
there are only 34 in support of the regulation. And so it, the, the, the change in the regulation. So um, 13F, uh, the, the, the asset levels stand for 13F at the moment. And I, you know, in a time of, of loosening regulation in the last administration, um, it was sort of interesting to see the, the industry snap back on 13, the 13F proposal like it did. Um, that was the only even um, thought of changing anything in, in uh, during the pandemic, but but things have changed markedly on the um, the way the way investors and managers interact, right? Oh, absolutely, yes. I think what we've seen, uh, you know, um, you know, in our cap intro business, you know, what we do in the truest sense, right? We're calling investors all day long finding out what they're looking for. And when we have a suitable manager, we like to make that presentation or introduce that manager. Uh, just to give you some, uh, you know, real brief statistics here, pre-pandemic, um, and I'll be very honest with you, and anybody who's on this call as a manager has tried calling investors, you you probably get this as much as we do. It's not an easy process, right? Um, you know, very rarely, I don't know how many times have you called and had somebody pick up on the first ring, expect your call and really be uh, ecstatic to hear from you. Um, so we understand the landscape, I guess, is the point I'm making. And pre-pandemic, we averaged about 17 dials to the phone to get one investor to pick us up. Um, as the pandemic uh, you know, got going at its highest point, probably last spring, heading into summer, um, those numbers went up. We averaged probably 24 to 25 phone calls to get one investor on the line. Now that could be uh, um, a number of reasons, a lot of people working remotely, a lot of the office numbers we had maybe weren't rolling over the cell phone numbers. We seem to be only using cell phone numbers nowadays with everybody working remotely. But those numbers, you know, did go up. Now, one thing I will say is uh, since the fall, right after Labor Day, we've really seen uh, an increase um, in engagement and activity on the investor side, which is great news for managers, right? So. Um, because now those 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 call numbers have come down to we average about 11 dials of the phone, maybe 11 or 12 to get an investor on the line. So we're certainly seeing more engagement. And I think a big part of that is just the, um, you know, the investor community is, is really adapting to technology and embracing, uh, the, you know, the virtual uh, environment now. Or, right? I mean, you know, it will be perfectly honest with you. If someone's going to write you a uh, 50 or $100 million check based on a Zoom call, I don't think so. However, um, we have seen some allocations take place to smaller tickets, a million, two million, uh, without actually meeting in person. So as, in regard to doing due diligence from an investor perspective where they'd want to go see your office, kick the tires, um, and, and meet you in person, um, we've definitely seen some, uh, you know, you know, adaptation of technology. So, you know, everyone will do, you know, do their Zoom calls. And what we found is investors seem to like this, right? I mean, it, it reduces their expenses, right? Because they're not traveling all over the country and they can actually, uh, you know, screen and see more, more managers. So it opens it up a little bit. So whereas maybe a manager, uh, an investor might go out and see, you know, five or six managers uh, for, you know, for an allocation he's considering. Now we might see, you know, he might look at 10, 12, perhaps more because it's easier um, you know, as opposed to going out on the road and visiting everybody in person. Now, uh, you know, you could probably knock out that first round of calls two or three days on Zoom and see up to, you know, 12 to 15 potential candidates. So uh, we definitely have seen uh, more acceptance of the electronic and virtual environment, um, you know, which is great for the industry, great for managers. Um, so that's just a couple of, one of the real big things that we've seen come out of the last 12 months. So Hopefully, I uh, Dan, between Dan and myself, we answered that question. Um, at this point, I don't know how we're doing on time. I think we're getting a little bit close on time. So we do want to uh, give the audience a chance to ask any questions. I, I apologize. I don't see anything in the chat. So I don't know if there are no questions or if I'm just not looking at it properly. So um, Eliza, if you see anything, so please let me know. Yeah, I don't have anything in the questions panel. Go ahead and, and fill those in um, really quick if you have those. We have about five minutes left. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I'll go ahead and close out um, with a little bit about um, our capital education series. So um, again, thank you to everyone for coming out today. Um, like I said at the beginning, this webinar was recorded and we will provide you the slides. Um, this is part of our Richie May capital education series. 
And um, there are some topics coming up on the slide there. So obviously due diligence is a big topic. Um, we have additional ways to raise capital. Um, we'll be having uh, you know, all sorts of guest speakers to help provide value to you guys out in our AI community, um, like we had with Cap Intro today. So stay tuned for more announcements about more sessions of that um, coming up. We'll be sure to send you those email invites. Um, and again, thank you to uh, our speakers today and thanks for everyone for coming out. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And again, just real quickly, we just uh, at Cap Intro Solutions, Dan and, and, and I would love to just uh, say thank you once again, Richie May. We're really, uh, we're just uh, so, so grateful to be part of this presentation today. Uh, I just want to bring back up some of our information here. You'll see our, our two websites out there for Cap Intro Solutions, Cap Intro Nexus. Uh, and our email address is down low. Uh, if we can be helpful in any way of helping you grow your fund and, and, and gaining some assets, uh, please feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, that's my job. I speak to uh, many, many managers all day long. So I, I look forward to speaking uh, with uh, many of you. And in fact, I think I've spoken to some of you already that are on this call today. So I appreciate that. And again, I will throw it back over to Elijah, but thank you so much. We really appreciate being part of today's presentation. Great. I didn't see anything come through while we were wrapping up. So thanks to everyone again for joining us and uh, we'll reach out to you if you have any questions in the future. Okay. All right. Well, thanks very much.